In a typical home, seven miles from the laboratory, a student had contaminated doorknobs, towels, and water faucets. His bedspread and pillow, his slippers, his armchair, a writing desk, and his pencils, his clothes, all showed radioactivity. Since the contamination had spread outside the laboratory, where it could have been handled more effectively, drastic measures were called for. Decontamination teams ripped out carpets from a dozen homes. Automobile mats and seat covers were junked. Shoes, which were only lightly affected, were scrubbed again and again until instruments indicated they were clean. The laboratory building was premeded with radioactivity and showed concentrations of radon, radioactive gas given off by radium. Men entering the building wore special respirators. After a few days, crews went into the structure and burned the surface of concrete areas with scaling torches. Paint was removed. Every foot of the building was washed down. Linoleum was peeled up. 200 drums of highly contaminated objects, principally carpets, clothing, linoleum, and cleaning rags, were weighted with concrete and dumped into 100 phantoms of water far at sea. The building itself, a 31-room structure, could not be used for three months. Everything connected with radioactivity is complicated by its indestructibility. A piece of contaminated newspaper cannot be burned except in a special incinerator. Even then, the ash must be carefully disposed of, and the gases and smokes given off in the burning must be washed or filtered. Then, the poisoned water and filters must be isolated or bur buried. Once more, we refer you to the nine-octave chart. To describe radium is to describe them all, for their effects are the same. One should know them all, however. Practically all of the deadly killers are on the red side of the spectrum. You will gleam the reason for this in later chapters. They begin with three silvery white metals on the lowest of the radioactive octaves, the silicon octave. The first two are sodium and magnesium. Sodium will set water on fire and burn its oxygen out if you throw a lump of it in water. One small pinhead of it as a free metal will kill you, but when deprived of its metal quality by union with chlorine, you need it in minute quantities in your body. It is table salt. Magnesium is the familiar flashlight of photography. Naturally, its radioactivity will kill you if taken into your body in its free state, yet you need a minute fraction of it as a mineral salt. Alunium has such a density that its radioactive powers need not be feared in that octave. But in its succeeding octaves, it gradually becomes more deadly than radium. Its highest form is acetium, which is an element between radium and uranium. The sodium series included, including lithium, potassium, rubidium, caesium, and an unknown element one octave higher, are in the deadly class especially because of their power to destroy oxygen by expanding it with such quick death that it burst into flame. This effect is so little understood that a brief example will simplify it. If you touch a match to oxygen, you will get a hot flame. If you compress oxygen into a liquid and then touch a match to it, you will get a hotter flame. For you have multiplied its speed and expansion by multiplying its compression. Sodium, calcium, or potassium multiply the expansion of oxygen in its gaseous form and give forth the heat that liquid oxygen would give. Likewise, oxygen is multiplied in its heat-giving power if united with calcium carbide to create an oxalithian flame. Probably said that wrong. Consider the deadliness of potassium in this respect by the following example. You will find potassium one octave above sodium. You very freely take carbon and nitrogen into your body. They are two of your five essential elements. 
If you add a minute amount of potassium to them, however, you produce cyanide of potassium, a deadly, quick, electrocuting poison. This is an example of what a minute quantity of radioactive matter would do if added to the essentials of our blood plasma. That is why leukemia, birth deformities, and impotence will be the forerunners of greater scourges to come. We will again leave these thoughts in abeyance until they are more completely tied together at the end of the book. <coughs> we have stated before that all of the elements of matter are frozen flame. The general active compressive force of nature quite easily freezes low potential explosions. Each succeeding higher potential requires greater effort to freeze it. Therefore, it requires greater heat to melt it. The highest melting point of all the elements is 3,600 centigrade. This high point is reached at carbon. Silicon in the next octave reaches only 1,420 degrees and cobalt only 1,440 degrees. The great unexplained mystery of melting points is the fact that the red side of the carbon octave reaches high melting points because of the fact that two of them are dense solids. On the blue side, all three are gases and have melting points as low as 220 degrees below zero. Fluorine reaches this point while its mate on the red side, which is lithium, reaches 186 degrees above zero. It seems strange that this octave of the highest maturity has three below zero elements on its blue side and high ones on its red side, when the dye-in elements have very high melting points on the blue side and less than half of those points on the red side. It is more strange still to meteor meteorologists that many of the elements in the radioactive half of the chart are heavier and much more solid than carbon, the heaviest element on the living side of the chart. Tantalum, for example, reaches 3,400 degrees, while its close neighbors on the blue side reach 2,900, 2,700, 2,250, 1,750, and 1,063. The answer to this is also more clearly defined later, but very briefly, the reason is that the red side of the spectrum represents the fatherhood of creation, which seeks the inside of forming spheres where the fires of creation are centered, and the blue side represents its motherhood and seeks the outside to fashion bodies in her womb and cool them into form. In the first half of the electric creating process, the blue half is compressed out of the generating body by exploding from within, while the red half gains its center by compression exerted from the outside. In the second half, the situation is reversed. All nature is constantly reversing, and in doing so, is constantly turning inside out and outside in. This conspicuous and obvious fact of nature has not yet been sensed by observers. The foregoing has described the manner in which nature projects motion from space and space reflects it back again. The one point which we insinuate in this whole process is the highly explosive nature of the radioactive metals. We do this for the purpose of demonstrating that this high and quick explosive power is needed in nature's death process to assist in the decay and death of the slow dying rocky formations which first constitute the bodies of new planets which nature has set out from her sun crucibles to freeze millions of years or perhaps billions are consumed in the process of decaying enough of the earth's surface to create the conditions necessary for organic life such conditions cannot be possible nearer to the sun than 70 to 80 million miles, and cease to be possible when a planet reaches as far out as Mars. Water, oxygen, humus, and the necessary 
carbohydrates of life are created by the exploding metallic bullets of the dying elements as they assist dense elements to die. But if they also project their death into less dense bodies such as animal tissues, those lesser solids and the gases of their atmosphere will again be assisted in their desire to expand, which is inherent in all matter. In conclusion, therefore, we say to you that every ounce of free radioactive metal which is removed from its purposeful position of bombarding the unfertile, dry, hot rocks of nature to yield pairs of bodies for making organic life possible on this planet will not only clear the entire planet of organic life, but will keep it thus cleared until the many uranium piles above ground are entirely dissolved by their own radiations. The number of thousands of years necessary for that is not predictable, but it is calculated by authorities that plutonium rays have a duration of over 20,000 years. That is a long time. The dawn of consciousness was but 10,000 years ago. How far back will man be, therefore, when he again appears on Earth, Earth, if he ever will? This next chapter is The World Voice. This chapter is devoted to the world opinion and the world fear of radioactivity. It is not written to support the evidence we have given, but merely to express the world voice. We include it also because the world fear does not know what it fears. The effects are known, but the why of those effects are not known. That is why we must write the why, else the danger will be beyond remedy before the world becomes aware of it. We will cite two reasons for this statement before we quote the press and the fears of scientists. Our first reason is our belief that the greatest danger from the use of radioactivity is defective births and leukemia. That danger will creep upon civilization without any way of detecting it. One cannot go about with instruments to measure genetic damage, as one can do to measure the amount of strontium and other radioactivity, which is falling on the soil from year to year. We believe that sterility will be an accompanying effect, while abnormalities of living bodies will be secondary. It could not be otherwise, for genes are not basic in potency. There is something behind and underneath genes, and that is the seed. No human has ever attempted to explain the seed. Therefore, it is permissible for us to say that the principle of rebirth in bodies is not yet known on earth. We know it, however, and because of that we know the danger which has no meaning to those who do not know. This mystery has to do with knowledge of the purpose of inert gases in relation to the seeds of things. We will more fully explain this mystery in chapter 11. Right here, however, we can say that every living body refolds into its seed simultaneously with its unfolding from its seed. With radioactivity in general use, it will not be many years before the translucent light of the inert gases, especially niton, which we described in relation to the deadly blue-white light radiations from radium, and the still more deadly blue light of uranium, will make seed regeneration gradually impossible in either animal or vegetable species. This is the danger, which will come unannounced. It is one of which we are most apprehensive and could cost millions, hundreds of millions of sterile humans and more millions of defective births. Geneticists have already begun to talk about mutations, for they understand how the seed pattern can be altered by abnormal environment. But beyond that, to the seed itself and its manner of refolding, a dimensional material image, such as a hundred-ton oak, into a dimensionless, weightless, formless micro pinpoint inert gas recording of itself, they do not know. 
nor does anyone know what the blue-white fluorescent light of inert gas from radium or from plutonium means to the seed and to sterility. We believe, for instance, that if a reactor plant such as the Hanford one in Washington is placed north of New York City, as now planned, it would not be many years before the whole of that vast watershed would have to be abandoned, including many other cities near New York. To us, that is as much a certainty as that a two-foot-high sapling will be ten feet high in a few years. It is an orderly mathematical fact of growth. In the processes of nature, it cannot be otherwise. One could be forewarned of that danger before it had reached that extremity, but one cannot be forewarned of the sterility of all organic life until it has affected possibly more than half the population of the whole world in various degrees. When radium was first used, its danger was not known. No one was then forewarned of it. Because of that fact, a laboratory worker named Dr. Emil Grubb was constantly exposed to it until he developed cancer burns. These did not kill him, but since then he has had to undergo 90 operations because of them. He still lives at 81, but his isolated case would certainly number millions by 1970 if nuclear fission comes into general use. Does it make you feel comfortable to contemplate that fate for you and more especially your children?